Well, greetings to all you hopeless ampaholics out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's video which is going to be a little change of pace from the series of very technical videos that I've been posting lately. I thought it might be fun to just do a, an old-fashioned amp restoration video and what better candidate than this little gem right here that was sent to me by a very generous viewer uh, named Robert and he said that he'd had this thing for years, he'd done a little work on it, but realized he'd never get back to it, so he sent it to me so that I could finish it and share the experience with you all. So without further ado, uh, let's check it out from stem to stern, and then get to work on making it sing like an angel. First off, you can see it's missing one foot up here, so it's listing to starboard a bit, uh, and that'll be an easy fix. Uh, let's take a look at the grill cloth, which is actually not cloth at all, but a screen uh, that has been flocked, if you'll pardon the expression, um, which is a, a way that was very common back in the old days, uh, so that you actually have this metal screen that protects the speaker, but it's um, uh, audibly transparent so that it doesn't attenuate the sound that much. I at first thought it was a true tone amp, but no, it's a true sound amp. And I can find absolutely nothing on the internet that even mentions the existence of such amps. So no doubt it was built by someone else and simply sold uh, under this uh, nameplate uh, by God knows what company. Uh, but uh, if anybody has any information on true sound, please share it with us. The cabinet and covering are in wonderful shape, just solid as a rock, a little bit of wear on the corners as you'd expect. Uh, up here you can see where they changed the handle from the original type with two uh, clips here and then that strap handle that would run in between. Uh, this looks almost like a fender type handle and is not correct so I'm going to remove it I've already ordered the little uh, metal brackets here and a, a matching brown colored leather handle for it to put it back uh, to its former glory. You've got to love it when people take the time to do things right. Uh, Robert sent me the tubes separately packed in a box wrapped in foam. Uh, almost like you know it was just meant to be this way and you know darn well these tubes are going to be in good shape. Uh, so I look forward to testing them and reuniting them with the chassis. Robert also sent a really neat tube chart uh, so that I can get the tubes back in the chassis uh, in the right configuration. I've laid the amp face down on the workbench here so that we can get plenty of light inside to take a, a good look. You can see that the chassis is that uh, wrinkled brown finish which is so common on these early uh, amps. Uh, something odd that I think uh, is, it bears investigation is it's got two uh, input jacks here and another one here uh, and I'm not sure we'll have to look inside now I have no schematic on this as I said there's no mention uh, on the internet of true sound at all and we're gonna have to try to guess it who actually built this but anyway I thought that was a really weird configuration unless that's an output for an auxiliary speaker you see that Robert cut the cord here to prevent this thing from being plugged in uh, when it's not ready to be plugged in. Got a really nice uh, power transformer here. And then these colorful uh, phenolic tube bases with one Bakelite base over here that has screws mounting it. So I have a feeling this has been installed. Uh, these are original. One thing that uh, piques my uh, curiosity is I see there is no output transformer mounted on the speaker basket and I see no output transformer here so uh, hopefully there's one underneath the chassis. We'll have to see once we remove the chassis from the uh, cabin. I also see these I guess speaker wires here that have been removed and there is a label on the back of the uh, Alnico magnet uh, cover here that says uh, something about woofer and recone. Okay, so uh, I'm guessing the speaker's been reconed. Let's hope it was a good job. And let's also hope that 
these are the speaker wires and that they will be easily reconnected to the speaker and that it will function properly. One last thing which makes uh, no sense on an amp in this beautiful original condition is why somebody trashed the wallpaper up here at the top. It's all been shredded and ripped away and uh, you can see where the screws for that incorrect handle have uh, been drilled through the lid and uh, they have these sort of uh, lock nuts here uh, pressed into the wood. Uh, I'll have to reattach it and maybe hunt down some brown paper so I can redo the sealing surface. As you can see the tube complement is fairly uh, traditional 5Y3 rectifier, 6V6 output tube, uh, 6SC7 which is a duo triode with a single cathode and also a 6J5 triode. Once we start looking at the circuit we'll figure out the purposes for these tubes. Also I'd say judging from uh, the tube complement uh, this amp probably is uh, from the 50s I think if it were from the 40s uh, things might be a little different. And this note right here probably explains that sort of oddball uh, jack. It is a line output. The speaker code is 465 which is uh, Oxford which to me is rather unusual and uh, an American uh, 50s amp. I think of Oxford's more in like 60s Fender amps so this may be uh, an added in later speaker. Uh, maybe we'll be able to figure that out. But judging from the size of that Alnico magnet, this is a high quality speaker. So I'm expecting uh, to get some pretty good sounds out of this jewel. So now without further ado, let's undo the three feet and pull this chassis out and see what's going on. Well, everything looks really nice inside, except for a few little details like what is this wire sticking up here and connected to nothing. Um, it looks like the electrolytic capacitors have been changed with a newer can. We'll have to test the ESR values on that new can cap. And also something I think is really cute is there's three disc capacitors stacked up here like a stack of pancakes. Okay, that's, that's kind of unusual. I guess they couldn't find a single capacitor that had the right value. But what's scaring me is the insulation is a little roasted right here against that pin. Um, I don't know if there was a short. Let's hope not. Okay, it doesn't look as if the power cord was particularly well grounded. Uh, naturally, since it's been cut, uh, let's see, out here, it's going to have to be replaced. Also, lo and behold, we do have an output transformer. It's not exactly a big beefy one, but uh, it's there and it looks healthy. Let's hope. Okay, so I think I'm going to draw up a real quick schematic of this thing uh, so uh, we can see what's going on. And since no schematic is available, uh, this will be a first. I'm particularly interested to see how this so-called line output works because it is connected to the 6J5 triode. Uh, makes you wonder if this isn't like a preamp output rather than an auxiliary speaker output. For those of you who have a hard time reading schematics, uh, you might try drawing one out sometime. Maybe start with a Fender Champ or some real simple basic amp. I really think if you could draw the schematic, you could probably read them from that point on rather easily. My method's very basic. I just draw each of the elements of the amp circuit and then I'm going to connect them together and put the uh, capacitor and resistor values in where appropriate and uh, then uh, I'll have a pretty good uh, really what amounts to is a layout drawing then for the circuit. I can see now why Robert cut the power cord because it was installed incorrectly. First off it, the ground wasn't connected. Secondly you can see the hot wire goes directly to the power transformer primary and the white return wire neutral runs through the on off switch which we know is just not acceptable practice. The reason this is not acceptable is uh, if the amp is plugged in it's never turned off. Okay, uh, Voltage is always being applied to the transformer primary. Now if the transformer developed uh, some sort of short to ground and the chassis is grounded, you're going to have a dead short here that can't be turned off, uh, uh, short of pulling the plug, and uh, it's just going to go up in flames. So as you can see, this is just not the way to install a power cord.
And this is something else I shudder when I see. Uh, it looks like the exposed wire from this capacitor is shorting the on-off switch. Look at that. It's You see the bare wire, it's within maybe a 32nd of an inch of shorting. Very worrisome. You've got to be real careful where you route these wires so you don't get inadvertent uh, short circuits or connections you don't want or need. Now the old improperly uh, installed power cord uh, has been removed and a new power cord has been installed with black going through the switch uh, and then to the transformer, white going directly to the transformer, green bolted securely to the chassis with a lock washer. Also this was the death capacitor that had been installed here and I thought oh, I might as well just remove it. Okay, so death cap out. Now our primary wiring should be correct. The only thing missing of course is a fuse and I might uh, install a surface mount fuse holder in here because uh, I certainly don't want to drill any holes in this chassis. You know the beauty of drawing your own schematic if you don't have one is you find all sorts of mistakes. Look here that's pin 2 okay that's the high voltage and see this wire from the high voltage is coming over here to the 30 microfarad uh, filter cap uh, lug. Then after it goes through a 1500 ohm resistor it's coming over here to the 40 microfarad lug. So in other words they wired this backwards. You know that your first capacitor, the reservoir capacitor, first one encountered by the high voltage is always the highest value. So I'm going to have to transpose these two wires. Well, I believe this jewel is finished. Uh, let's review uh, here quickly uh, the uh, modifications that have been made. Uh, number one, a new three-wire power cord has been installed with a proper chassis ground. Also, you'll notice the black hot wire now passes through a snazzy 
uh, surface mount fuse holder with a one and a half amp fuse to protect the circuit against excessive current flow. Comes back up here to the on off switch. Also I had to alter the sequence of electrolytic filter capacitors so that the 40 microfarad cap was first uh, so that we'd have proper uh, filtration and smoothing of the uh, rectified B+. Naturally I cleaned both the pots here with deoxid as well as the tube uh, bases and I had to replace two capacitors that didn't check out uh, when I tested them. Number one was this cathode bypass cap from the 6SC7 and another was a 0.2 microfarad cap to ground and I happen to have a really nice NOS um, kind of period cap here to install so that it would still look old-fashioned. So now I guess it's time to flip it over, uh, plug in all the tubes, hook up the speaker and see if it works. Also, uh, here's the little schematic that I uh, filled out as I was uh, circuit checking. To be honest, I don't really need this as a schematic, but it was a way of me going through systematically and making sure that each wire in the uh, circuit was in the right place uh, and connected to the right component. Okay, I flipped it over and I think you can uh, appreciate the cleanliness of it. I used uh, some fine oil and went through and, and kind of dusted and it darkens the paint, makes it look nice. Nice little decal here on the transformer. I don't know if that's an original transformer or a replacement. Um, looks original to me. Okay, let's hook up the speaker, uh, insert the tubes, and plug it in and see what happens. Okay, the tubes are in place. Speaker is connected with jumpers and we're plugged into the trusty current limiter. Let's turn it on and see what happens. Remember this is the volume, this is the tone control. Okay, it's absolutely silent, which either means the filter caps are working beautifully or it's not fixed. Let's uh, crank the volume up to halfway and touch the input. No? It works beautifully. Perfect. Okay, about all there is to do now is hook in a guitar and see how it sounds. Okay, we got it all buttoned up back in the cabinet and ready for the sound check. Thought you'd want to see how it looked. Uh, chassis back home where it belongs. Got the uh, label off the back of the speaker. Everything's looking good from this end. Four new rubber feet, not three like before. And the screws that hold the feet also hold the chassis down, so they serve uh, two purposes. I cleaned and polished the top of the cabinet, uh, repaired uh, where that old fender handle had been installed, and aged uh, some new metal brackets and a new leather handle and installed it so that it looks uh, more proper for this uh, vintage of amp. And on the front, nothing was changed. I touched up the corners a little bit, um, and that's it. And as you can see, it's a handsome beast. So let's plug it in and see how it sounds. Okay, we got it plugged into the current limiter back here. As you can hear, it's dead quiet. Uh, we're going to try something a little different. Uh, Jack and Ollie have been working on some jazz tunes that they thought you might like. So I'm going to turn over the sound check to them. Uh, I hope you enjoy it.
very nice, Jack. A real change of pace. Uh, now let's hand the guitar over to Ollie and see what he's prepared for us. Good Lord, Ollie. I guess we should have expected that from a stray cat. Well, I guess that's about it for this video on the Mighty True Sound amp. I wanted to express my thanks to Robert for sending it to me and for all the Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors uh, who have made this video and all the videos possible. If you'd like to join them in supporting this advertising free channel, uh, please see the video description for links that will enable you to do so. Uh, meanwhile, uh, thanks for subscribing. Thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you on our next video.